me begin with a call to worship. Stand fast in the Lord. Have no fear. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in the time of trouble. Do not be unnecessarily concerned about the tomorrow, for God knows what we need. We give our lives anew to God to be used as God sees fit. Let me have a brief invocation. May the wind, the sky, the sea, may it call us and remind us of your love and that we are truly free to live our lives in sweet accord, to be attentive to your word. May we begin to live our days in ways that truly show our praise by serving well our native land, giving each a helping hand. In Christ's name we pray, amen. When I was in seminary, I took a course called the Book of Psalms. Uh, I love the Psalms, Psalms and Proverbs, you know, sort of in the middle of the Bible when you, you open it up. But I was telling uh, Shirley a little while ago, I don't think I've ever preached a message, uh, a devotion, whatever you may want to call it, from Psalm 107. Um, I'm going to pick up toward the middle of it. It's about a fellow out at sea, and uh, things are not going very well. And the theme of this is the Lord delivers from trouble. I'm at the 23rd verse. Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous words in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plot. They reeled and they staggered like drunken men and were at their wits end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad because they had quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the sons of men. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. There ends our reading of uh, just part of uh, Psalm 107. <clears throat> it's actually a pretty long psalm. Let me have a pastoral prayer for us, please. Lord, our needs are as many as we are this morning. We need your word of pardon. Some of us have been unloving toward another. And some of us have been untrue in our word to another. And some of us have neglected in caring for another. Grant us assurance of forgiveness, of new beginnings, of new possibilities. We need your guidance. Some of us here struggle with a decision. Some of us here wrestle with a problem. Some of us are wading through troubled waters. Grant us guidance, direction, and resolution. 
we need your surrounding strength. Some of us are suffering in body. Some of us are lonely. Some of, of us are afraid. Grant awareness of your presence and your power and your peace. We need your love for the world. We have many other needs, Lord. Some are even too personal to name in a worship service. Some are too complicated to even put a label on. Some are too threatening even to admit to ourself. But you know them, and you know us, and you are with us. We thank you, Lord, listening to our conversation that we call prayer. In your name we humbly pray. Amen. There are some times when we just don't know what to do next in this pandemic. Circumstances pile up in such a fashion that no matter how hard we try to do what we think is the right thing, it seems as though there is just no way out of these days. Ernie Pyle, if you recognize him, you probably had a journalism course. He was a very famous newspaper man. He had an alcoholic for a wife. On one occasion when the outlook was bleak to the point of despair, he wrote to one of his friends, another editorial friend, I should say. He says, if you have any light, for heaven's sake, shine some of it in my direction. God knows I've run out of light. In the Psalm 107, we have a vivid description drawn from life of a seaman caught in a violent storm which tossed their frail vessel around like a toy. In any way, he thought, being the seaman, that his time had come. They were at their wit's end. They didn't know what to do next. Is there anyone here this morning that probably would be not feeling like they're part of this? I doubt it. We all have fears. We all have things happening in our life. This message today is intended for all of us. As I think of each of us, we all have some real challenges in our life. And sometimes I think we feel like we are at wit's end. By way of solution of the problem, I want to quote a line not from an ancient saint, but from a modern one. A woman that I knew way back in Dayton, Ohio, at my church called Trinity many years ago. She had been through a lot of joy and a lot of pain, and I loved Darlene. She was a wonderful lady. She was a woman that, well, she was old enough to remember homesteading in an unfriendly valley. She lost her husband while I was pastor of the church in a horrible car accident about a half a mile from where Dayton had their shooting at Orion. And making her way also through a great depression. And yet she raised, I've got to say it the way it was, six honorary boys. She managed to keep things together. She used to say to me when she thought I looked discouraged in this kind of changing neighborhood, this inner city church, she would say, Pastor, it's time for you to come and recognize that you may be at the end of your rope, you think, but tie a knot 
and hang on to it. In the first place, when we reach wit's end, we need to tie a knot of regular routine. I believe in the months that we have been living, it's important for us to stick to some kind of schedule if we can. Follow as nearly as possible some kind of personal activity. Time itself often proves to be a, a great ally for us. Problems often dissolve in the fluid of changing circumstances, even for us. Most of us would be surprised if we would today write down all of our worries and then check next Sunday to see how many are still there. We would find that many of the problems that we have will take care of themselves. I used to love to read Robert Louis Stevenson. He used to say that a well-ordered mind in a time of crisis is like a clock in a thunderstorm. It just keeps up its regular ticking. There is a moving scene in the second book of Samuel. Actually, it's one of the real X-rated stories of the Bible. Now you may have missed that, so I'm going to go back so you can all make sure you can read it later. Again, the second book of Samuel has one of the real X-rated stories of the Bible. It's about David, David the king. He had taken for his own another man's wife. And to make sure there wouldn't be any trouble, David had the other man killed. The child of their union was stricken ill. And David, regarding his misfortune as the judgment he felt of God was on him, took on a kind of personal experience related to his repentance. But the child still died, and he changed his clothes, and when they asked him what he wanted, he wanted some food before him. Then his servants said to him, What is this thing that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while it was alive, but when the child died, you arose and ate food. They couldn't understand it, but his actions were those of a man in his right mind when there was nothing else that he could do when he reached wit's end he found his life again losing it in some regular activities there once appeared an article in one of the national magazines dealing with training of airmen at wright patterson air force base i saved the article because i'm always have been proud of Wright Patterson Air Force Base. It was about what does an airman do when he loses his plane and he comes down in a wilderness. The Air Force Instruction Drill magazine that they printed said, do this for your survival. Face the facts, make a plan, keep busy, and keep trying. In short, they say when circumstances bring you to what looks like you're at wit's end, your dependable antidote to anxiety is a purposeful activity. After Jesus had been crucified, the disciples were numbed almost into inactivity. Their world had collapsed. Their Messiah had been executed. They hardly knew which way to turn. 
they were probably doubtful and even uncertain. Oh, and then came Peter. He made his way back from Jerusalem to the Sea of Galilee, back in familiar surroundings. He took his regular routine once more. He said to the group, hey, I'm going fishing. And he did. And it seems probable that it was only then that the realization came to Peter that his master was not dead, but alive. And then he set out on a missionary career, which made him, of course, the cornerstone of the entire Christian church. When you're at wit's end, tie a knot of regular activity and hang on. In the second place, when you reach wit's end, tie a knot of service. When you don't know what to do with yourself, do something for someone else. Alfred Adler was a very famous and well-known psychiatrist. He used to tell his patients, stricken with the blues, as he called them, that they could be cured in two weeks if they would try to think every day of some way to help someone else. A number of generations ago, there was a movement that swept this country. Only a few of us might remember it because of our age. It was called 10 times one clubs or lend a hand clubs. They sprang off all over America. They were an outgrowth of a, actually a, a story written by Dr. Edward Everett Hale in which the author and clergy person has suggested four lines of a motto that was used. Look up, not down, forward and not back, out and not in, and lend a hand. He had forgotten the idea that the story came from that of a, of a railroad freight agent. And the agent said to him, be cheerful, and be helpful lend a hand and the lend a hand gospel was part of our world for a number of years one of the true stories of mental illness is in a book and maybe you've read it i really recommend it called cliff's edge one of the illuminating little side lights of the main story as it were is mrs hackett's description of one of her neighbors and what happened the small gray-haired woman had heard that Mrs. Hackett was in the hospital for some severe psychiatric treatment. When she came home, the neighbor came over and she said, I know a lot of people tell you two things. I'm going to give you some money to help you, or um, I'm going to give you some magic formula to feel better. She says, I'm not going to do that. She said, I'm going to make you something for your meal, and I'm going to take care of your rowdy children for a little while, for a couple of hours. She says, I hope in some way you'll really know that I care. I want to lend a hand to you by giving you something to eat and caring for your children. I think she was on the right track. When you reach wits in, tie the knot of service and hang on, look up and not down, forward and not back, out and not in, and lend a hand. And finally this, let me suggest that when you're at wits in, that you tie a knot, and you expect a preacher to say this, tie a knot of religious devotion. The passage that I read from Psalm 107 was actually a service of thanksgiving and devotion for those who were on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. 
They knew that they had come through a lot of trouble beyond their own power to escape. And they believed that they had found the hand of God that got them through this. Through the years, I have found that the testimony of persons of faith when everything else was difficult was that God was still there and God was part of their life. There are times I'm sure in this pandemic when people like us, ordinary supports of life seem to be gone. Money seems precious. If money is no longer part of you, there are other things that seem to bother you. Life seems to be in a tailspin. Many persons are losing jobs and savings. Some are having health problems in this time of crisis. We may boast of our physical well being for years, but we all go through times, folks, of having tough health problems. It's part of living. Sometimes friends go, the fair weather variety are the first to take off. Even some of our most loyal friends may move away. Some are taken by death. Even families go, parents die, children grow up, and you know, they establish their own homes and their own lives. While they may think the world of us, and we of them, still our interest in many ways is very different. Just about the only final and enduring support is one's religious devotion. I share that with you. I believe it with all my heart. When a person finds that there's just more trouble than they can handle, when they're at wit's ends, I encourage them to find their religious devotion, their commitment to Christ. I didn't give Cheryl, and I'm closing here, I know I've been a little wordy today. I didn't give her my favorite hymns. Emily did most of them. But one of my favorite hymns is from Martin Luther. Barbara, a good Lutheran. It's called, A Mighty Fortress is our God. Both the words and the music were written by a great reformer in the year of his deepest depression, and he had real depression. His wife was carrying their second child, and he himself was recovering from a severe illness. The dreaded black plague was all around, and their little boy named Hans was so desperately stricken that he neither could eat or drink for 11 days. The wife of one of their closest friends died. Protestant and Catholic princes were battling with the tide going against the Protestants. So in the depth of sickness, sorrow, and anxiety, Luther turned to the Bible. And I hope you remember this. He turned, first of all, to the book of Psalms. It restored his soul. It led him by the still waters of faith. It fed him in the green pastures of the Spirit. And he turned his religious devotion to such a point of writing that stirring him that I love so much. A mighty fortress is our God. When you're at wit's end, tie a knot of religious devotion and hang on. I close with this short, short story. A group of naturalists were seeking specimens. They had discovered one, but there was no way for them to get down to it and no way to get it up. Out in the field, they saw a boy helping his father in a nearby field. They screamed, they hollered. Finally, the young boy heard them. He asked them 
if we tie a, a knot around you, a rope, and let you down, will you help us bring the plant up? The boy was not very enthusiastic at all, but under some urging from not only the man that asked, the other fellows, he agreed he'd go on one condition. He said, I'll do it. I'll do it if my father holds the rope. When you reach wit's end, the end of your rope, remember that our heavenly and caring creator who loves us all very much through Jesus Christ will give us guidance and direction. Tie a knot and hold on even during these troubled times. Amen.